Uh, there Tim we go. Raines. Tim Raines. Okay, so Tim Raines is uh, the Chief Security Officer for Microsoft. Yes. Uh, and he's going to be talking about a video here. <coughs> uh, the question we're going to ask you for this one here is, what is the website address for security tools? Now, don't forget, you have to follow MS underscore IT Pro. You have to also tweet with the TechNet VC hashtag, as well as contest hashtag as well. Um, and we're going to have a little um, fun contest with this next <laughs> video. It, it, we do this on Windows Weekly as well. When certain words come up, we say everybody drinks. And you can drink whatever you have. Coffee, water, water you got it. whatever. Uh, so any time you hear in the Tim Raines video any word ending in I-O-N, take a sip. But be careful if you're drinking something yeah. not. A little high octane. Uh, a little high octane, we'll nice. say that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Naz Naz, hey, go ahead, roll the next one for Timmy. Hi, my name is Tim Raines. I'm Chief Security Advisor of Microsoft's Enterprise Cybersecurity Group. Today we're gonna be talking about trends and exploitation. I'm going to talk about how things go from theoretical to actual when we're talking about vulnerabilities and exploitation. So many of the chief information security officers and CIOs that I talk to around the world, one of the things that concerns them is unpatched vulnerabilities and zero days. Uh, the way that organizations generally get uh, compromised, there's really four ways that, that uh, organizations get compromised. Weak passwords, misconfiguration, social engineering, and unpatched vulnerabilities. So we're gonna dive into unpatched vulnerabilities here and take a look at that. A lot of organizations go into panic mode when their software vendors release security updates. At Microsoft, we release security updates on the second Tuesday of every month. Now, it's easy to panic because now you have a new batch of updates to deploy to systems, and you know the bigger and more complicated your environment, the more complexity there is involved in patching that environment. And so um, a lot of customers, well, there's angst involved in that because now the, the, the stopwatch has started. They're trying to get their environment patched before the bad guys can reverse engineer those patches, figure out whether they're exploitable, write proof of code concept, and then try to mechanize that and attack them using those uh, vulnerabilities. So I think a more thoughtful approach is taking a look at, of those vulnerabilities that get released by vendors around the world, which ones are actually exploitable? Which ones are actually, uh, can be actually used for attacks against our customers? And so having a look at this, the cornerstone of Microsoft security strategy is what we call the security development life cycle, or SDL. The goals of the SDL are to reduce the number of vulnerabilities in Microsoft's products, and then to reduce the severity of those vulnerabilities in the products. Remember, there's generally three severities. There's critical, there's medium, and there's low. The critical ones are the ones that enable remote code execution and are theoretically wormable. Now, I say theoretically because that's what vulnerabilities are. Theoretically, a bad guy could use it to attack a system that's unpatched. And so we took a closer look at these vulnerabilities. Now, across the entire software industry, every six months, there's usually between 2,000 and 3,000 vulnerability disclosures. So that's 6,000 vulnerability disclosures every six months across the entire industry. Uh, not all vulnerabilities are the same. Some vulnerabilities are higher severity than others. And some vulnerabilities have what's called higher or lower access complexity. Access complexity is a measure of how hard or easy it is to actually exploit a vulnerability. So what we see in terms of trends is we see lots of high severity vulnerabilities being disclosed because the security researchers, that's where the money is. They're trying to find high severity vulnerabilities because those are the ones that everybody's interested in. And then from an access complexity perspective, unfortunately, we've got lots of high severity vulnerabilities and medium severity vulnerabilities across the entire software industry, but we also have a lot of low complexity vulnerabilities, meaning it's trivial to actually exploit those vulnerabilities. When we'd like to see lots of high complexity vulnerabilities, because then you'd have to be a brain surgeon to figure out how to exploit those. And to compound things, when we take a look at what type of software these vulnerability disclosures are in, you typically see a lot, there's a lot of concern always around browsers and a lot of concern around operating systems. But when you add up all the vuln disclosures in browsers and operating systems, that's typically 15, 20, 25% of all the vulns. Meaning that you know 80% plus typically are in applications. An application being something that does not ship in a browser and does not ship in an operating system. So for our customers, they're in a situation where there's lots and lots, thousands of vulnerability disclosures across the entire industry every six months. 
Uh, most of those vulnerability disclosures are, are high or medium severity. And then most of those vulnerability disclosures are low access complexity or trivial to actually exploit. And they're in applications, the bulk of them. So the challenge really is, not only do you have to patch your Microsoft software, uh, Windows and Office and SQL and Exchange and all of that stuff that you're doing on premise, but you also have to make sure that you're patching all of your line of business applications, all of your other software from your other vendors. Because since 1999, when the, the uh, CVE database was, you know, began in NIST and the Department of Homeland Security started tracking common vulnerability exposures in the industry. Since 1999, you know, Microsoft's portion of those industry vulnerability disclosures has trended between 3% and 7%. So that means that up to 93, you know, between 93 and 98 percent of vulnerability disclosures are in other people's software. So for organizations, they really have to focus on patching because you've got a situation where there's lots and lots of vulnerabilities in applications, and it's not very obvious because a lot of those applications don't have the ability to update themselves. So it takes a lot of focus and rigor to inventory those applications and all their components and keep them all up to date. But if you're not doing that, that's where there's real risk. And so when we took a look at Microsoft's critical rated vulnerabilities between 2006 and 2014, we did a study to see our most critical rated vulnerabilities, how many of those are actually exploitable. And what we discovered is in any year, you know, the, when we take a look at all of the critical rated vulns and which ones are exploitable, uh, a high year would be 40% of the vulnerabilities that were released in a single year that were rated critical could actually be exploited. That would be an extreme year. For the most case, we've seen a 70% reduction in exploitability of critical rated Microsoft vulnerabilities between uh, 2011 and 2013. And it goes even lower than that in 2014 and 2015. So you might even be seeing an uptick in the number of, of security bulletins and patches that you have to deploy to your environment. But the actual number of those that can be exploited has actually gone down dramatically. And the reason for that, I mean, it's not an accident, is the security development life cycle. A big part of the security development life cycle is making it hard or even impossible for vulnerabilities that exist to be exploited. So you have vulnerabilities, we release patches for them, you rush to deploy those patches, but you have to take a close look. What is the exploitability of those patches, of those vulnerabilities that are being patched? Okay, That's a key question, because if it's not even exploitable, the priority of those vulnerabilities, you, know, you should prioritize those lower than vulnerabilities that are exploitable. And so taking a look at exploitability becomes a key part of many of the customers that I talk to, a key part of their security strategy and their patch strategy for on-premise. The other thing we see is the timing of exploitation has changed over the years. We used to see a phenomena that we would call Patch Tuesday, uh, Exploit Wednesday. So it released the patch on, on, on uh, the second Tuesday of each month. And that, that Wednesday, what would happen is between Tuesday and Wednesday, the bad guys would reverse engineer those updates, find out where the vulnerability is, and then figure out whether they could exploit it. And if they were able to exploit it, then they would start doing some kind of exploitation on Wednesday, you know, on and on and on. And so what we wanted to do is try to eliminate Exploit Wednesday. And so we really, really focused on uh, the speed of releasing security updates, the Windows update, Microsoft update channels to make them more efficient, uh, to increase the quality of our updates. And over the years, we got really, really good at updating over a billion systems around the world. And so what we saw in terms of exploitation is that Patch Tuesday, Exploit Wednesday phenomena largely went away. When you take a look at the data today, if bad guys don't actually have a zero day and use it before the industry finds a vulnerability, their window of opportunity to use that vulnerability has dramatically shrunk over the years. So what we see today proportionally is we've shrunk the total pie of vulnerabilities so much that today you see the large proportion of zero day vulnerabilities because if we know about the vulnerability, we're going to patch it so quickly that their ability to exploit it has, has shrunk dramatically. And so one of the things that we've seen as a, as a direct result of this is exploit kits. Exploit kits are commercial kits that are sold or leased that contain exploits for known vulnerabilities. And what we've seen over time is uh, years ago we would see that exploits, new exploits that would come out for critically rated vulnerabilities would make it into an exploit kit 
weeks or even months after the, after the security update for that vulnerability was released. And what we saw in 2014 at the beginning of the year, we would release a security update on the second Tuesday. And within about 30 days, we would see uh, exploits for the vulnerabilities that could be exploited. Those would make them make their way into a commercial exploit kit. So about 30 days at the beginning of the year. By mid-year, uh, that had shrunk down to 10 days. We released the update, and then within 10 days, we would see uh, exploits make it into commercial exploit kits. And now, at, by the end of that year and into the first uh, part of 2015, we were seeing more and more instances of zero-day exploits being put into commercial exploit kits, meaning that the first time that the exploit is seen, it's already in a commercial exploit kit. Now, the reason why that's important is because uh, instead of using a zero-day exploit for a targeted attack, this is a trend where they're using a zero-day exploit for more broad exploitation. So they will put an exploit like that and use an exploit kit like that on a drive-by download site, a watering hole attack, or so on, to try to not just target one organization or one person, but to do a broad attack on more people. So it's, it's more dangerous to more people. And so, you know, between that first half of that year and the first half of the next year, that's kind of represents a 30 times faster cycle that we see going from the release of the update to, you know, exploit inside the exploit kit. So you have to ask yourself in a world like that where the bad guys have really sped up, you know, improved their game 30 times in a single year. Have you improved your patch management methodology that quickly inside your organization? Uh, have you sped up your patch management process 30 times? If you're still using the same you know, patch management methodology that you did five years ago, okay, you have to take a close look at that today because the bad guys, they've upped their game. At this point, if you're using a five-year-old methodology, that's probably great. It's probably really good in terms of rhythm of business and not disrupting your business. But the bad guys are faster and faster and faster. And so you have to keep pace because if your system is patched, it can't be exploited through unpatched vulnerabilities, which is one of the four ways I mentioned that people get exploited. So one of the questions I often get asked is, who is attacking and you know, what do they want? What is their motivation? And we've seen this change over time. And so uh, if you go back five, six, seven years ago, really the type of attackers that we saw were really motivated by notoriety. Uh, they wanted to prove that they were smarter than the big high-tech companies or the people that manufactured the software, uh, that they found holes that weren't patched, that they could exploit those holes. Since then, we've seen you know, the rise of profit as a motive. And so for many, many years, we saw people just focus on taking advantage of people, stealing identities, stealing information, uh, trading and selling that information. But in recent years, uh, we've seen more and more uh, different threat actors that have different motivations. So today there's more threat actors with different motivations than ever before. So things like hacktivism, where uh, companies, organizations, governments are being attacked based on their philosophy, policies that other people don't agree with. You're also seeing uh, the rise of uh, nation state attacks. And so really there's kind of two motivations there. One is um, economic espionage and one is military espionage. And so with military espionage, that's been going on as long as governments have been around and they've had militaries. Uh, and really they're just trying to figure out what capabilities are of different militaries and different governments around the world. And this will continue to go on forever. Now, what we've seen over time is when nation states get involved in this and do, for instance, military espionage and use uh, vulnerabilities and exploitation for this type of thing, what happens is that actually lowers the bar for people that are motivated by uh, profit and notoriety. Because I'll give you an example. Stuxnet is a great example where allegedly governments were involved in creating this, uh, this worm that leveraged multiple zero-day exploits. Now, when uh, that worm was discovered and the antivirus companies added uh, detection for antivirus so they can detect and block, clean that worm infection, the bad guys saw that. They looked at the vulnerabilities and figured out that they could take one of those vulnerabilities and put it into their commodity malware that they used to try to steal identities and so on. And so really, the, the, that military espionage and those, those folks identifying that specific vulnerability lowered the bar then for these criminals that now have baked it into the commodity malware. And that actually turns out one of the original Stuxnet vulnerabilities to this day is still the number one most attempted 
vulnerability exploited on the Windows platform, even though it's been patched on over a billion systems since 2010. And so this shows you, you know, some of the other threat actors, some of their motivations. Um, and so this is also the, the, maybe the hardest part for a lot of the CISOs and CIOs I talk to about defending their assets. Because on the network, on the internet, all these attacks look kind of the same. They all come across the network and look very, very similar. You can't tell from network traffic generally who the actor is and what their motivation is. And so if you don't know who's attacking you and what their motivation is, you don't really know what a proper response is. What is a proportional response? Who should help you with that? Is this a law enforcement issue? Is this a military issue? Is this an industry issue? Is it, who should I get to help me with this? Who should help me pay for the recovery of this? And so these, this is really what makes it, the lack of attribution makes it very, very difficult to do defense on the internet. Uh, the way it's designed today because there's not an ability to do strong attribution in, in the vast, vast majority of these attacks. You know, in terms of uh, guidance for IT pros and, you know, what should, uh, what should IT pros be thinking about in terms of security, vulnerabilities, exploitation? So the first thing is, you know, a lot of the IT pros I talk to around the world already get this. They understand the value of security updates. And of course, security updates can be inconvenient because you're patching systems. Some of those systems require a reboot. When you reboot it, you know, life's like a box of chocolates. Is it going to come back up or not, right? Uh, are you going to get into a mess where you have to troubleshoot a bunch of stuff? And so um, that's a really difficult part of an IT pro's life. But the reality is, is you know, attackers are not going to stop. They're going to keep coming. They're going to keep trying to find ways around defenses. And so a big part of your strategy has to be keeping systems up to date. And that's, that's hard work in many environments. And so, you know, of course, Microsoft and the rest of the industry have come up with a lot of tools to help you, some of them free, WSUS, and a lot of the tools that you get here at Microsoft over time, uh, as well as a lot of tools out in the industry to help you do that as well. But the, I think the right attitude to have is that security updates are not a bad thing, they're a good thing, because they're trying to protect you from bad guys who are trying to take advantage of you. If there were no bad guys trying to take advantage of you, then you probably wouldn't even need to patch updates, right? And so, um, first, you know, looking at updates is kind of a positive thing, is helpful. Uh, and then making sure that you're getting authoritative guidance, timely guidance, you understand you know, all the affected products, you're making sure that it's easy for you to identify those, those affected products in your environment, super important. Again, inventorying isn't always easy. Uh, keeping those systems up to date, understanding reboots. We know that reboots are painful. We try to minimize reboots where we can. Um, these are all things, I mean, this is a, an IT pro's way of life at this point, right? It's keeping systems up to date. And so I think that um, that stuff is super important. And then as I mentioned, you know, making sure that mitigations in the software that you're buying and maintaining, those mitigations are actually turned on is super important. Because if there is a zero day, if there is uh, a vulnerability in your environment that's not patched uh, because you haven't been able to roll out the patch for one reason or another, those mitigations are really the only thing standing in the way of exploitation. So using Emmet, using Binscope or some tool like this to actually look at your software and then demand secure software from your ISVs. If your ISVs are selling you software where all those mitigations are turned off, you should go back to them and ask them why they're turned off. Ask them for versions of the software where those mitigations are turned on. Because those things will help you with your security strategy and a lot of times will give you more time to app compat test uh, security updates and deploy them in your environment with more things, you know, making exploitation harder and harder and harder. And so the key takeaway here is you have to patch your software from all of your vendors. It's just not one or two vendors. You actually have to take a look at all of your vendors. If you make software inside your organization, you actually have to take a look at that as well because the bad guys don't care where the software was manufactured, whether it's Redmond, Washington, Cupertino, California, or somewhere else, they don't care, right? They're just trying to compromise your system, get onto the system, steal information, that they can then sell or trade. And so the key here is understanding that all of your software is being targeted. Uh, if your software is updated, they can't actually exploit unpatched vulnerabilities in that software. Uh, having mitigations in place and using mitigations is super important because if you do have vulnerabilities in the software and you do, do need more time to test patches, or there are zero-day exploits that come up from time to time, 
if you have mitigations in place that prevent exploitation or make it super hard for exploitation, exploitation to happen or make it super inconsistent if exploitation is possible, having those mitigations in place gives you more time to do your application compatibility testing and all the testing that you have to do in your environment before you're willing to roll out those updates. So having those mitigations in place is super important. Now mitigations like ASLR and DEP and CHOP, uh, these are mitigations that are built into Windows that are turned on in Visual Studio by default. So if you're compiling and linking a program, these mitigations are turned on by default. But what I see from time to time is people unchecking those boxes in the compiler, getting rid of those mitigations. And that means that if there are vulnerabilities in that software, there's nothing preventing exploitation of those vulnerabilities. So it's super important to understand whether those mitigations are turned on or not. Now there's a couple tools, free tools that we give away that will enable you to audit your software to see whether these mitigations like DEP and ASLR are turned on or off on an application by application basis on your desktops and servers. One of them is called Emmet, the Enhanced Mitigations Experience Toolkit. Uh, Emmet is a free download, microsoft.com slash Emmet. You can bring it down. That will show you all of the apps and whether you've got ASLR and DEP and some other mitigations turned on. The, the real magic with Emmet is in some cases it'll allow you to turn on these mitigations for software that, that have them turned off without re recompiling those applications. So in many cases, the ISVs that sold you your software went out of business or they don't, up, they don't uh, um, offer updates for that software. So Emmet can be a, uh, a, you know, a real value there because it'll allow you to turn some of these mitigations on in some cases for some of that software. Another tool you can use to audit software like this is called Binscope, and this is one of the, the SDL tools that we give away for free. So if you go up to Microsoft.com slash SDL, you'll see there's tools up there, plenty of tools. One of the tools is Binscope, and again, when you point that at a binary, it'll show you which of these mitigations are turned on and off. So really, really important that you look at you know, which, which pieces of software in your environment, all of your software have vulnerabilities, try to patch those. In cases where you can't patch or you need more time, look at what mitigations are in place. And then remember that not all vulnerabilities can be exploited. And so that's a key here, right, to understand uh, the software that you use, whether those vulnerabilities are even exploitable, because that really helps you prioritize which ones you need to patch, which ones you need to really focus on, and then which ones you can get to a little bit later. So with that, uh, it's been a pleasure. I think this has been a great talk, and I hope you, uh, you got a lot of value out of it. Welcome back. Lots of fun so far. I don't know. Uh, did, you, did you count how many we actually had for, uh, for the dot ION? The I SIPs, mean, the drinking game. Um, I kind of gave up. Yeah. I, I got to 13, and then <laughs> I ran out of water and had to get another cup. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh, I was trying to count them. I had a preview of that video, and I was trying to count the, the words that had the root word of exploit. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I completely lost track oh, no. of what was going on. But, no, uh, we have, one, of our, one of our viewers says, thankfully, the can ran dry, and I had to drop out before I drowned. <laughs> Rasbit. <laughs> well, it's, you know, security is definitely one of those topics yeah. that comes up an awful lot, uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually have a question here from Michael, but before I get to that one there, we had a question for you to right. ask uh, and answer. Yes. Uh, do you want to go ahead and yeah, ask let me that do that. Again? So the uh, quiz question was, what is the website address for security tools? Hmm. Now, we don't have Tim in the room to talk with us right. today because he unfortunately is currently tied up with, uh, you know, this little security <laughs> conference you might have heard of before called mm -hmm. RSA. Yeah, I've heard of that. Uh, so he's not here, <laughs> uh, but he did leave us the answer. It yes. was... Microsoft.com slash SDL, SDL, Software Development Lifecycle. Yes, very, very cool. Now, I remember there, there was uh, over, I'm dating myself here, over 10 years ago, I want to say it's closer to, bleep, 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 I want to say 12 almost now, I do believe, mm -hmm. uh, when the Bill Gates wrote that big email about how security is a priority right. and how literally all the engineers and software devs at Microsoft were ceasing and desisting yeah. all coding until they went through this whole engineering criteria of uh, software security development lifecycle concepts, uh, which eventually turned in the SDL. Right. Uh, and I remember that going on. It was a very, very big deal. It was. Um, so uh, definitely take it very, very seriously. Yeah. Tim's a good friend. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually like that That's that piece, that session. And apparently you do too, because I think we're peaking I know. at uh, right. a couple thousand viewers yeah. for watching that one there right. and making comments. You know, um, I... I kind of glaze over on a lot of security things, <laughs> I have to admit. But the one point he made that I thought was really interesting mm -hmm. is 
you can't just be thinking about patching Microsoft software. Right. Even if that's where you're, you're, you're worried about the vulnerabilities. He kept saying, you have to make sure you patch the third party apps, the line of business apps. You can't just only be patching Microsoft apps. And I think a lot of us who have to field people who are having bad patch Tuesdays mm -hmm. kind of forget that sometimes. And, you know, we can talk about the elephant in the room, uh, okay. you know, patch Tuesday. Uh, it is definitely something that has become the butt of a lot of jokes of it people, is, uh, but right. it is a very serious topic. Uh, and don't uh, we call it Update Tuesday? Updates. Now? The official word is Update right. Tuesday. <laughs> I actually, I actually used to have a, a podcast that I did when I was back in Canada that was called uh, Security Bulletins for the Regular IT Guy. Oh wow! Uh, Buddy and I used to get yeah. together. We'd analyze the different patches that were coming out just from the text description that was there, mm -hmm. and then uh, we would be in a coffee shop or in a pub, and we would talk about what they were and if they're important and if they happen to have um, reboots and stuff like that involved. Um, so I that, bet was, that was very popular. It actually was very popular. I bet it was. Uh, yep. People from Microsoft Corp actually started to copy the idea that we had, and they oh, well. started to do their own nice. too. Yeah, um, I mean, for me, I was telling you earlier, for my job as a journalist covering Microsoft, I'll tell you what happens on Patch Tuesday. Yeah. So, Patch Tuesday happens. Um, people don't test; they just apply patches without testing many times. Mm -hmm. Things break. Then they get on Twitter. Mary Jo, this broke my my whole IT implementation. Yeah. Tell Microsoft, can you help me? The yeah. next three days are just an endless parade. Yeah. So I I feel, I feel like another message from Tim's video is test. Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> uh, when I was working full time in the IT industry, patching was one of those just things that you had to do. And Tim actually made a point of talking about that. If you're doing the same process that you were using before, uh, for the last five years or more, and you haven't really updated the, the way that right. you're doing patching and how you're managing them and testing them, uh, you need to take the time to invest in it. And it's just an investment that you have to do, yeah. uh, to be able to do it. So obviously you have to go through and test. But he brings up another good point that actually I'm going to build upon this a little bit, is the fact that when we start talking about releasing patches faster and faster, right. eliminating those zero days as we can, mm -hmm. um, what about cloud environments? I right. mean, if you wait 20 seconds, there's another deployment on Azure. Yeah. Wait 20 more seconds, there's another deployment on Azure too, as an example, inside the cloud environment. And so it's going to get a faster pace as far mm -hmm. as having to go through and be prepared for what's going on mm -hmm. uh, with patching. And you have to go through and do your due diligence and testing. And the other part that you mentioned subtly inside that that I found interesting, which is completely true, up-to-date software. Yes. Not just from a patches perspective, but obviously, if you're running an older version of something yeah. uh, that's been around and was built for the threat landscape mm -hmm. that existed mm -hmm. seven years ago, a lot has changed in seven years mm -hmm. uh, that's out there. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a different set of um, build parameters that they have yeah. to build that kind of software and what they're testing for. Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously, updated software helps. Updating that software with updates also yeah. helps. Uh, Definitely. And then potentially even, I don't know if you agree with this statement or not, uh, Mary Jo, but um, from a... A DevOps perspective, from what um, Jeffrey Snover was mm -hmm. talking about, uh, the ability to have not individual Snowflake servers. Right. Right? Because right. right now, when someone goes ahead and breaks one of their imp implementations... Right. They only break one. They, they break one, right. but now they have to worry about re getting <laughs> exactly. that working again. Right. Uh, if it was more of an environment where they do the configuration, mm -hmm. could apply it back again, restore the data, uh, you could go ahead and um, get that back again exactly. relatively fast. But mm -hmm. We feel your pain. Updates are yeah. just unfortunately something we have to do. Do your dil diligence and testing. Mm -hmm. I'm getting word in the microphone that we do need to continue on because okay. our next one is ready to go.